Okay, well, first of all, uh, let me congratulate Qsoft for these uh, five years of wonderful work. I still remember, I mean, six or seven years ago when Harry was going around with his ideas of creating Qsoft and people were thinking, oh, what are you saying, software? <laughs> yes, yes, software. Now everybody wants to build uh, a software hub like you have there in Amsterdam and copying achieving your successful story. In particular, we want to do that. So we're very interested in, 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 in talking to you. So. Anyway, so as, uh, as you may know, I'm coming more from the physics side, so I'm not a, a, a computer scientist, but I'm going to talk about quantum algorithms. And so I just the first thing that I have to do is to um, uh, ask for your patience, especially for the computer scientists, because I'm not using very much your language and I will be a kind of a rough and uh, not very precise in many of this, my statements. You will notice that, but anyway, so you see I'm physically motivated. So what I would like to show is that actually quantum computers, as they are being built at the moment, they can be useful to solve some physics problems that are relevant and that appear in many parts of, of, of physics. And I'll talk about some algorithms that we developed for these devices. And this was done together with these two people here. Sibiu Liu is a master student in our group here and Mari Kanan Bayou, my news, is a senior scientist at uh, our institute as well. Okay, so I guess that you have seen transparencies like this very often in which uh, uh, we, we say that quantum many body problems are difficult to solve. The problems that appear when you have many particles or many objects that fulfill the laws of quantum physics and they interact with each other like in material science, in chemistry, in high energy physics, even in cosmology. And this is clear that they are very difficult to solve with classical computers because we, we typically do two steps. So first we model the systems, we make a lattice in space and we basically put a qubit in each of the lattice sites. And it turns out that all these models can be described just by doing that, transforming into lattice problems, where you're giving some operator that we call Hamiltonian that detects how these particles interact with each other and the goal is to make predictions about the behavior of those systems, so to start to know about the properties, electrical properties, magnetic properties, or if they are in one phase of matter or another phase of matter. And at the end, if we want to make these predictions, we have to solve a quantum many body problem. It means that we have many qubits and we will have to find what is the state that describes the systems. And at the end, will be a linear co combination of all possible configuration so that if we have at the end of this translation on a lattice with n qubits, then the number of coefficients that we have to describe, you need to describe the state, if we want to make any prediction, will grow exponentially in memory. So we will grow exponentially the number, so we'll require an exponential memory and exponential time. And that's why these problems in general are very, very hard. In fact, I'll come back to that a couple of times. Maybe you can try to trade a little bit of memory for time or vice versa. So for example, you say, what happens if I have a classical computer which has only polynomial uh, memory, memory that grows polynomially with the number of qubits, then you will take a time that is longer. And so this will be exponential to some power. So it can be like two to the n to the power n or something like that. So it's even, even worse. And this fact was noticed already many years ago before quantum information appeared by some people like Richard Feynman who said that actually if you want to study quantum many body systems, why don't you use a quantum system in order to store the state? So namely you just take any other system composed of qubits and you can prepare the state, then you will require n qubits to store the state of the system. And if you want to make a prediction, just perform measurements and you will be able to compute physical observables. So right away, you get that the memory uh, only scales polynomially with n, actually linearly with n for this system. So there is a huge advantage. And the time, depending on the problem, then it may grow like uh, polynomially or exponentially, but typically not worse than exponentially for this problem. So even if it would go exponentially, then you will have this uh, gain in memory. No? You, you treat it on equal footing that both of them have polynomial memory, then even the classical will go I mean, super exponentially with time, typical, with typical problems. So there is a huge advantage in, in, in building a quantum computer for solving these problems. And that's the most natural application of a quantum computer. 
In fact, with the, all these physical systems that we have now at hand, people are building these uh, kind of first generations of quantum computers, these noise intermediate scale quantum computers or analog quantum simulators. And with both systems, that it seems that they are very well suited in order to solve these problems, these quantum many body problems. Because in both cases, you have the qubits, so you can store in n qubits n qubits and then I mean you, in order to simulate the dynamics or to simulate the physics then you can make them interact with each other either with quantum gates with a quantum computer or with uh, in, a, in a kind of an analog way with analog quantum simulators and it turns out that the the errors even the fact that the errors that may not be that bad for quantum simulation so I may say something about that later on Anyway, so, so it's the kind of problems that I want to study here. So we have a lattice where there are certain particles, we call them spins, but you can imagine that they are all qubits. And you have a Hamiltonian, which is a sum of terms, each acting on a few qubits that are located in some region. So for example, I mean, one term of this Hamiltonian can act on maybe on these uh, eight qubits that are here, maybe another one acts on these five qubits. So I will use local Hamiltonians, and local Hamiltonians means exactly that, that the Hamiltonian is a sum of terms that are acting non-trivially only around some point in some region. Okay, so it has certain certain range. Because the things that I'm going to say also apply to some other Hamiltonians which have large interactions, but I will make some statements that only apply to these kinds of problems that actually in physics, this is very natural that you have local interactions. In fact, so, so the, the all the, you say the standard model, which is the origin of all theories, is local, has this property. If you discretize, it will have to be local because otherwise you would be able to violate causality. So in, in a sense, I mean, taking local, then if you go to a sufficient fundamental level, all Hamiltonians would be local. Okay, so, so the first ingredient is that I, I have a lattice where I put my spins, maybe in the vertices, maybe the links, or maybe in both of the lattice. I have qubits, maybe these are instead of two-level systems, there are qubits and D-level systems. And for quantum simulations, they can even be fermions, but I will not talk about that, but this also works with, for fermions. It can be any spatial dimension. And the only, I'm saying, uh, restriction is that I'm going to talk about local Hamiltonians. And the question that I want to answer that I will specify later on much more precisely will be, I would like to know what is the dynamic. So you start with certain initial state and you evolve according to the uh, dynamics generated by this Hamiltonian. So you like to make predictions of what will be some properties of your qubits after some time, some expectation values after some time, or you could be interested in thermal equilibrium. I will specify this, but it means that you have this at finite temperature, then you would like to know what are the physical properties of this system, either at zero temperature or at some other temperature. Okay, so there can um, kind of quite a few algorithms in the market to solve these kind of problems. So in fact, we know already for many years that to solve the dynamics, this is very efficient. So you want to make predictions about the dynamics of your system, then the computational time scales in the best algorithm as the number of qubits that you have, as the time that you want to simulate, and as the logarithm of one divided by the error that you're going to make. And I mean, the first idea was coming from Lloyd, who proposed is to take e to the minus IHT, this is the evolution operator, to totterize it, to make it small steps, and then each of the steps to treat in terms of some quantum gate. And so that already showed that it was efficient, but actually there are more efficient ways of, of doing that. So for the ground state, however, the problem is difficult. So in fact, it's, I mean, you formulate it probably is QMA hard. And so therefore the computational time would be exponential with the number of qubits. However, I mean, there are some heuristic algorithms like QAOA, variational algorithms that people are trying and that may be you know, useful in these this devices. I'm not going to talk about, about them. And then there are these finite temperature uh, algorithms. There are not that many, they're actually very few. And uh, so some of them are based on some quantum Monte Carlo or to create some Gibbs state or something like that. And all of them are exponential and the reason why they're exponential is because of course final temperature include zero temperature which is the ground state and for ground state we know that this is a difficult problem so it's QMA hard so this problem in full generality is QMA hard as well. So my talk is going to be about this finite temperature what we call so quantum algorithms for finite temperature and energy and I will define this more properly later on and the first thing is that I mean one algorithm will be efficient means will be 
uh, polynomial in the number of qubits, whereas the best classical algorithm that we know to solve that problem is exponential, and I will argue that. And then I will have, I'll introduce some other algorithm which actually uses a quantum computer as a subroutine, and it uses the quantum computer to be able to sample. And so this will be a, you will be using an algorithm to sample in a classical computer, but in order to sample, then you will use the quantum computer as a subroutine. And it turns out that if you do that, this algorithm circumvents a big problem in physics, computational physics, which is called the sign problem of classical Monte Carlo. So I want to show that when I mean, you modify this first algorithm, you can make it very practical and actually get around one of the problems that exists in classical simulation of quantum systems with computers. So I will tell you what the sign problem is, I will tell you what Monte Carlo is, and I will tell you what I mean by efficient, I will tell you what I mean by finite temperature and energy and so on. And the other feature is that, I mean, it can be applied to NISC and quantum simulators or analog quantum simulators can tolerate some errors and easy to implement. So actually we are now uh, implementing them in some of the existing analog quantum simulators and these devices. Okay, so let me talk about, let me formulate the problems that we want to solve a little bit more mathematically and they are uh, motivated by physics. Okay, so that again, I come back to the problems. These are the kind of problems, then we reduce them. So you can reduce it to a problem, which is at the end that you have a lattice, you have some qubits in a lattice, and you have a Hamiltonian, which is local. That's what I mentioned before. And now it will be important to look at this Hamiltonian. And because this Hamiltonian is an operator, is a, um, a joint operator, and the, uh, an important, uh, an important uh, property of this operator is the spectrum. So let's look at what is called the energy spectrum. So these are the eigen, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of my Hamiltonian. And so now you can take a Hamiltonian, which has the peculiarity that is not only self adjoint but is local. It's very important, it's not a general Hamiltonian, it's local. And you can look at what are the eigenvalues, and then you can plot here the eigenvalues, and this is what we call energy. And you will see that this will be discrete. So since the, you have n qubits, then you will have the Hilbert space, as I mentioned, two to the power n. So you will have two to the n now energies that will be just um, distributed in your energy spectrum. And you see something uh, happening here is that most of the energies are at the center and there are a few energies at the side. And actually this is due to the fact that this Hamiltonian is not a random operator, it's local. And in fact, well, you can also find the, the lowest energy. So this is the minimal energy is what we call okay, the corresponding eigenstate is what we call ground state. So this would be the E that corresponds to this energy, this is the ground state. And if we take about any other eigenstate, then we say that we have finite energy. Ignacio? Yep. Sorry to interrupt. There's a, there's a question. Do you mind if I, if I interrupt oh, you? Stop, stop, okay, yeah. great. So, um, the question uh, starts by saying, I can imagine it's complex to find a set of local Hamiltonians that represent the actual Hamiltonian. Um, there must be many ways to represent these or, or are there not? How is this done? Well, of course, you can, you can always regroup them in different ways, but it doesn't matter. I mean, they will always be local. And then on the other hand, if you give me the physical problem, then I will tell you what is the Hamiltonian. Okay, so that's, I mean, easy to do. This translation is very easy. Okay, so this is why we start with a Hamiltonian, that is a sum of local Hamiltonians. Of course, you can reshuffle, but this will not change anything. Okay, thanks. Okay. Good, okay, so I was talking about the spectrum and I was saying this before, that more, there are more states at the center that on the sides, and this is represented I mean, physics, we, we call density of states. So the density of states, what you do is that you take certain interval, and then you count how many states are in this interval. So for example, you take this interval like that, and there is two, then three, the four, and then you plot the number of states in this interval as a function of the energy, and that's what we call the density of states for a finite interval, it depends on the interval. But at the end, if you start growing n, you put more and more and more and more, and at the end, it's not so independent on the interval, and then you, course, you find curves like that. So most of the states are in the center, and in fact, it's very easy to show that the, the, you will have certain curve here, and this curve will have a width that scales like a square root of n. And this is, again, because you have a local Hamiltonian. So somehow you compute the variance of h squared minus the expectation value of h squared or something like that, then you get that there are n terms and that's why you get the square root of n. So the width is the square root of n and this will be important later on. And okay, so now we could increase more and more and more and put in more, but I mean, at the end, it's, it's, it's useful to use what are called intensive quantities. 
So we know that the number of terms that are in my Hamiltonian, there is like one term per qubit. And so the total number of terms scales like n. So the total energy, the total, uh, say the, the, the typical width of your spectrum will scale like n, will be proportional to n. So this is why we divide by n. And this is what we call energy density, is the energy per lattice site somehow. And so now what we can do is to do the same plot, is exactly the same plot, but instead of drawing here e, I draw e divided by n. And so what will happen is that now if I'm increasing this n and n, then this will get narrower and narrower because now the width will be square root of n divided by n, which is one divided by square root of n. And so you see, uh, I mean, that's typical in physics problems is that if you just normalize with the energy density, then there are many, many, many more the states are at the center of the spectrum and there are very, very, very few on the sides. And actually there will be exponentially many in the center and only polynomially many in the sides. And this is why there will be difficult to find some some physical properties numerically. And in fact, so physically, what you're typically interested is in fixing some energy density here and the scaling log system and making it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and see what are the physical properties for states that correspond to this energy here. And, and, and that's the kind of problem that, that we want to solve. So, and, and you would like to know what are the physical properties, so expectation values of some observables, expectation values of sigma c, for example, of one of the spins. And, Okay, so now we can formulate a little more precisely what is the first problem. Okay, the first problem that I want, would like to address is you fix the energy density, okay? And so this is the energy per lattice side. Then you take an observable. This could be a local observable, sigma c on, the, on one of the particles at the center. And then what you would like to take is one state corresponding to the extensive energy to in time n times e, Okay, because we say that E is equal to it, you divide by N, so you fix small E, then you multiply by N, this gives you some energy, and then you would like to take an eigenstate here with this energy and then compute the properties of this observable at this energy. As you have noticed, then since this spectrum is discrete, then it may happen that there is not an energy exactly at this point. So this is why you have to be a little bit more careful when you define this problem. You have to put a little width here, and so what you can say is that you would like to compute this for a state that has the mean value or the expectation value of the Hamiltonian equal to capital E, so that this here is the expectation value, and that it has certain variance, which should be delta square, so some variance here. And so the goal would be now to compute for a given E, a given observable, and a given variance, to compute this expectation value and to see for some prescribed uh, precision epsilon. And you would like to know what's the computational time, how that computational time scales with n and also with epsilon and this with delta. Okay, so you're giving some energy and then you would like to find some state which has this mean value of the energy that has a variance that is sufficiently small, delta, and you want to increase n and to know so how what is the computational time. And now from the physics, you know, if you want to get interesting physics out of that, then this delta, you should scale it also with n. I will come back later, later on to that. So for civic, civic, uh, relevant problems, then the interesting uh, point is when this delta scales like one over n. So when even if you increase n and you make delta smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, now, now the problem number two is very similar. <laughs> Is the same thing, but instead of pure states with density matrices, which is basically the same, you have, you fix the this energy, then you compute E times E, and you impose that the expectation value of your energy of, of your Hamiltonian with some mixed state is equal to E, the variance is delta square like before, and you will like to compute the expectation value of this observable with your density operator, and you impose that the density operator is diagonal in the basis. And uh, also with some prescribed description, uh, precision and variance. And again, you would like to see how the computational time scales with n and delta and epsilon. In this condition that the density matrix that you're using is diagonal E, it's very useful in physics because then you can show that actually this delta doesn't have to scale with n. So you, get, you want to get physical properties that are interesting from the physical point of view then you just have to keep delta constant. So it's the same problem as before, but if we have density operators that are, uh, that are diagonal, then it turns out that the restrictions of delta are, are, are milder. You want to get some, I mean, let's say relevant physical system. So, because you can look at the problem abstract, which is this one here. Don't forget about how to scale delta. 
but you want to apply this to a physical problem and to get something that is useful, then in the previous case, delta you will have to scale like one over n, and in this case, delta will have to be constant. Okay, and the third problem is related to thermal equilibrium. So this is a particular case of the previous ones. So my density operator now can be written as an exponential of minus the Hamiltonian divided by some constant, this Boltzmann constant divided by t, and you see it's the normalization constant. So what it means basically that you have the spectrum before, and each of the states that appear in the spectrum, you multiply by some probability, which is this exponential, and then you sum all of them, construct the density matrix, and then you would like to compute expectation values, and these we call thermal equilibrium at temperature t. Uh, Ignacio, there's yep. a, a question. Yep. Um, uh, it says that this, it sounds counterintuitive that the relevant delta is different depending on whether you allow mixed states or not. Why yes. do these cases to differ? Okay, well, it's related to the fact, I mean, it's a physical question that when you compute the expectation value, there would be in the other case, of observables, then there would be, in this case here, you put an observable, there will be diagonal elements and off-diagonal elements. So you will have a linear combination of different energies, and the, the off-diagonal elements, it turned out that they behave very badly. And this is why you have to make them very small. You want to converge, to have some convergence. So it's related to what is called the uh, uh, ETH, or the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Anyway, so it's a, it's a, it's a technical point. Yeah, there's another question. Yep. Is, is the state rho or psi given or is, is finding it part of the problem? No. Okay. So finding it is part of the problem you want. Okay. And this is where, this is what I will, uh, I mean, I will not be very precise. That's when I say that I will use more the physics problem and the physics uh, statements rather than being very precise of how is the form problem, the, uh, problem defined. So here it will be find the state psi and do that and do that and do that and do that and you will see what is the meaning later on when i introduce the algorithms so here not i'm, I'm aware that i'm not very precise but i mean i don't want to be very precise because then i would spend much time explaining the problem than the solution oh there's another question what yeah. are they unique or are any no, state with these no, properties any state would be fine any state would be fine i mean it turns out that in physics any state will give you if you scale it in this particular way will give you the same value basically com converges to the same value as n gets large. Okay, so here's the, again, the problem, formulated problem number three, is you fix this parameter T, what you call temperature, fix the observable like before, compute the expectation value. Now, this is, this is precisely, this, this is now a, a specific density operator, which is parameterized by this T and the Hamiltonian with some precision, and then you would like to know how the computational time scales with n, with the size of your system. Okay, well, I hope that the problems are more or less uh, uh, understood. So what are, what are the problems that we want to solve? And let's just say a couple of words about classical algorithms to solve them. So you go to problem one and two. These are the problems in which you are giving some energy. That's what we call finite energies. You're giving energy, you're giving some variance of your state, and then you would like to know what are the expectation values of your observables there. Turns out that of course, you can do it always exactly with a computer and then it will take an exponential time. Now, the best way that uh, we know how to solve this, this problem in one dimension, at least, is with tensor networks. And with tensor networks, actually, it takes an exponential time to solve this problem, exponentially in one divided by delta. And also, there's some dependence on n. But anyway, this is what I wanted to say here. So it turns out that the, if you want to describe these states that have small variance in energy, typically they have a lot of entanglement. And if they have a lot of entanglement, I mean, it's difficult for tensor networks. And this means that your bond dimension has to grow exponentially with the entanglement, let's say the entropy of entanglement. And if you do the calculation, then you find that then the computational time scales like exponential of one divided by delta. And for problem number one, I told you that we need delta of the order of one over n. So you see that the computational time grows exponentially for this particular problem. And I mean, I'm not aware of anything that would work better than that. And even in higher dimensions, then, I mean, we don't know other ways of doing that. We can use tensor networks, but they don't work that well. Okay, so for the other ones, for the, and, and okay, for the, for the problem number two and number three, what you can do is use some of the methods that are more efficient than tensor networks. And these methods are called Monte Carlo. They are based on sampling. However, for certain 
Hamiltonians, this problem, this, these methods have what is called the sign problem. And in these problems, these methods, Monte Carlo methods, require an exponential time. And I want to explain briefly what is the sign problem because it's a very, I mean, big problem that appears in physics when one wants to use Monte Carlo methods to solve quantum many body problems. And for that, I took a simple, simple case. So imagine that I want to compute this expectation value of an observable in rho, where rho is my state. Now it's normalized like that. It's the state that I wrote before. And imagine that now uh, my O that I want to see is diagonal in the computational basis. Okay, let's make it simple. So then you can see that you can compute now the trace in the computational basis. So this would correspond to different qubit configurations. And then, of course, it's, it's diagonal, then it means that this will be just a number. So at the end, you see that computing this expectation value is nothing else than sampling with a probability that is proportional to this number here, and then computing some value, some mean value. And that's exactly what Monte Carlo does. It samples according to this Pn, and then computes this O, and then it does it many times, and then the error in the sampling, we know how it decreases, it decreases like one divided by the sampling number of samples squared, and how this is, this is uh, the, the basic idea of quantum Monte Carlo. Now, the question is that, of course, if you want to sample, you have to be able to compute what is the probability. You, you sample one configuration, and you have to you use, for example, Metropolis algorithm, you have to accept it or not, depending on what is the probability that it has. So you have to be able to compute the probability or something proportional to the probability like this quantity. But this quantity in itself is a many body problem. It's, I mean, if you want to do it exactly, it will take an exponential time. So this cannot be done in practice. However, for some particular Hamiltonians, it turns out that this can be done. And the idea is that you take this e to the minus h divided by t and you trotterize it. So you just write it as a product of exponentials, each of them with a very small coefficient. And then you put the identity operator in terms in, in, in front of each of these trotterizations. So at the end, your probability distribution can be written as a sum with respect to this identity, these resolutions of the identity that you put at each point. And now you have a quantity Q of N and one, Q of N one and two, et cetera, et cetera, with this Q and one and two is this quantity. It's now like the original one, but it's off diagonal. And now the trick is that if this M is very large, this exponent is very small, so you can use perturbation theory to compute this quantity. So you can compute this Q. And if this Q turns out to be a positive number, then you can interpret this probability like a product of probability distribution so you can sample. So what you do is that if these quantities Qs are positive, then you will just sample not only one configuration, but M copies of your configuration, but you do it and this works very well in practice and that's quantum Monte Carlo. However, it is required that whenever you do this quantity, that this is positive. And this is generally is not positive. It's only for very few Hamiltonians that it turns out that this is positive. And if it's not positive, then you say that you have the sign problem. And therefore, you cannot use that because then your Pn that you have here will not be positive, And then it takes an exponential time. So that's what I'm saying. So if you kind of problems when you want to compute this quantity, if you don't have sign problem, meaning that you can do this trick, then you can compute this very well. And this works very well. And this is why some problems of quantum many body systems can be simulated with classical computers very well. However, you have the same problem, you cannot use this method, and I mean, some other methods you cannot use either. So summarizing, the kind of problems that I was giving at the beginning, finite energies, then at least with the best known algorithm that I know, tensor networks, it takes some exponential time, we scale the things as I mentioned. And what I will talk about is a new algorithm in which for solving this problem, it would take a time that is polynomial in n, one divided by delta, and one divided by epsilon. So there is an exponential speed up as compared to this best classical problem. However, um, there will be some restrictions that I will mention later on. And for finite temperatures, I will not prove that it's efficient, but I will show that with a quantum computer, then you, could, uh, you can uh, uh, circumvent the sign problem. So you would be able to use the quantum Monte Carlo that I told you before, and then you use the quantum computer in order to compute this quantity that you cannot compute classically or to sample according to that quantity. That's the whole idea. Okay, so with that in mind, now we can go to the quantum algorithm. And so I start with finite energies. 
And so that's the problem that we had before, right? And you fix the energy, fix some variance, find some state. And of course, if we treat with full generality, this problem is QMA hard. So in particular, we take the energy that is here, is in the ground state, then we know that this is QMA hard. Oh, we have one more question. Yeah. Can you please clarify the uh, errors, harmonic and thermal? And once the thermal condition inside of the quantum computer is absolute zero. The errors? Oh. Uh, I would like if the writer can ask the question himself. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understood. Uh, okay, let me just ask the person. Uh, Juan, can you uh, ask the question yourself? Okay, maybe we'll come back to this question. Okay. The okay. End? Yeah. Go at the end. Okay, good. Okay, so now, okay, so again, so seen in the plot that I showed you before, this is that you fix this energy here, and then you would like to increase the number of qubits in your lattice. And as you see, you already see the problem is that here, as we're taking more and more qubits, there are less portion of the qubits that, sorry, of the states that are in the energy that you want, and that's why it gets hard just to get these properties of states that are here at the, at the tail of your distribution. Okay, so now the algorithm that we propose actually is relatively simple and uh, the idea is the following. So first, prepare a state with this energy, okay? And this state could be, for example, a product state if you can, if, it, if there are product states of that energy. And of course, if you prepare a state, actually will have a variance which will be large, so this will not, I mean, this is not good enough. So the second part of the protocol or, or the algorithm, what it does is that it will reduce the variance and it will reduce it from the original one to Delta. And the third part, what we'll do is that actually will not prepare a state with this Delta, but actually will do some measurements that would give you the same result as you would have prepared that state, but without preparing. And that's very relevant for quantum simulators and these devices because otherwise the coherence will kill you and this will help you with the coherence. So let me go through these steps one by one. Okay, so the first thing is that in order to be able to solve this problem, you should be able to prepare a state with this energy with your quantum computer. So let's take, for example, it's a product state, but it could be some other state. And of course, this product state would be it will not be an eigenstate, it will be a linear combination of these states. We will have some, some variance. And typically, this variance will be of the square root of n. So you can also compute it and you will see that this case like square root of n, this variance. Okay, I mean, one has to, I mean, one can prove that this is always possible for some energy density larger than some minimal density. So whatever Hamiltonian you give me, there is some E minimum in such a way that there is always a product state that fulfills this property. So if you give me an energy that is below that, so you want to prepare an energy that is below, then this algorithm will work as long as your quantum computer can prepare a state of that lower energy. For example, with adiabatic algorithm or anything else. And this, you see that is, that is a restriction. And this is the restriction that must be there because otherwise we would be able to solve QMA hard problems. So the idea is that you are able to prepare a state with that energy. Now, of course, once you have prepared this energy, then the variance is, is very big and this state will be completely useless. Imagine that you prepare a state, then it will not tell you anything about your Hamiltonian because, for example, you will not have correlations. You compute the expectation values of different qubits, of observables on different qubits, they will be uncorrelated. And in physical system, they are correlated. This is why we have to make it thinner now in the variance. And the idea to make it thinner up to delta, that's what we want, is to apply some operator here and, and this operator, we will take a Gaussian operator. So we apply a Gaussian operator that this center at the energy E that has a width delta. And this Gaussian operator you apply to the state. I mean, it's easy to show, show that then you will have a variance here, which will be the variance delta that you have. Now this operator is remission, but it's not unitary. And so, I mean, you cannot apply it like that. So you have to do something with it. And in principle, what you could do is to take the Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform. And in fact, you can write it in terms of some evolution operator here. And so the idea is that out of the state P, then you would like to create this linear superposition with some classical coefficients that you can compute efficiently. 
and this evolution operator. So here you will have like a linear superposition of states that are evolved during different times with coefficients that you can compute classically. Now, of course, you, the first thing that you can answer is, so how many coefficients do you need to put here? And it's very simple to show that the number of coefficients that you need there is goes like a square root of n divided by delta. And the second thing is what is the maximum time that appears here? And the maximum time that appears here runs was like one divided by delta. So you see that your algorithm, at least the number of terms it has, is case polynomially with n and with one over delta, and the maximum time also polynomially with one over delta. And as I noticed before, because the state is not normalized because the operator that applied is not unitary, so in principle you, you can do that probabilistically. And I mean, this may be difficult for these NIST devices or quantum simulators. So the idea is that you don't do that. You don't prepare the state at all. So what you do is that since you at the end want to compute some expectation value, then what you can do is to re-express this expectation value that you want to come up with in terms of the state psi. And if you just do that, I mean, you just have to replace it here. Then you see that the expectation value can be written as some classical I mean, as C number that you can compute efficiently and some quantities, and these quantities are just expectation values of the evolution operator with initial state, the product state, or the state that you were able to prepare, and something similar. So this means that in practice, you don't have to prepare the state and then measure this observable, but you should be able to compute these quantities, because if you're able to compute these quantities, then you will be able to replace them here and then compute the expectation value. So this is the whole idea, just to measure these quantities. And to make sure, that, okay, that the compute this quantity with a quantum computer, you can do it efficiently. And then when you put them here, then that this does not get exponentially small in such a way that the computational time in this case properly. And with that, then you would compute at the end the O with the classical computer. So you will use your quantum computer just to measure these quantities, okay, several of them. And for example, with an analog quantum simulator, it turns out that this is relatively simple. And the idea is that, if you want to compute this quantity, actually imagine that you can measure the absolute value square. Then it turns out for Hamiltonians that are very natural in physics, like Hubbard Hamiltonians or spin Hamiltonians, it turns out that this quantity here can be expressed like the absolute value times some phase, but the phase can be computed classically efficiently. So this means that this is the only thing that you have to measure. But this is just some probability. It's the probability that you start with some state evolve and you end up with the same state. So in practice, with this analog quantum simulator, like with all atoms in optical lattices, you could start with some, let's say, atoms in some spin configuration. Uh, then this is your product state that you prepare initially, then evolve for a certain time, and then check what is the probability that you're back in the same state. You measure many times, and then you will get this quantity, and out of this quantity, you put the phase, you get this quantity, and with that, you just substitute it. And you can just see, so what is the error that you're doing? Because you're, I mean, sampling and so on, and, and everything works, I mean, as, as you want it. So in summary, for this finite energy, the algorithm is that you prepare a state of that energy, and it's a precondition that you have to have. Now you have to boil for a time, this is more than one over delta, and measure and do it several times. And then you have to repeat for a square root of n divided by delta different times and do that. And at the end, you compute the uh, expectation value with a classical computer. And you can check that the computational time is polynomially with n, one divided by delta, and one divided by epsilon. And in particular, if this delta is one over n, that's what I told you that we need for problem number one, then this is a polynomial time algorithm. And what is important is that it can be used even with analog quantum simulators. Okay, so I'm finishing now with the second kind of algorithms, the sampling algorithm. And it is, is, uh, is to adapt uh, the same, uh, is to adapt the same concept. And so this is the problem that we wanted to have. First, the one which is the energy, this is the delta, but now we have a density operator and we have to have something that is diagonal. And so how does this computational I mean, uh, time scales with n? The same question as before. And, now, the idea, as I mentioned, is now to use the quantum computer in order to help you to sample with a classical computer. So what is the idea? The idea is that you can, you can take some particular diagonal distribution, which is a Gaussian distribution, 
And so this expectation value with this state, which has this Gaussian distribution, so this would be like PEE, -E, the one that I wrote you before, just take a Gaussian, then you can rewrite it like that. And it's very easy to show that this equation can be written in terms of the quantity that I gave you before. So it's exactly the same quantity. So this means that if you're able to sample according to this probability P, P, which is this number here, then you will be able to compute this quantity efficiently. So it's like the Monte Carlo that I was mentioning in classical computers at the beginning, where you will have to sample with certain probability P of P and then compute some value for each of these samples. And the question is how you compute this quantity, but this quantity is what I showed you that you can compute efficiently before. So this means that now this algorithm will run as follows. So you, first of all, we choose some configuration, some P configuration, then you choose another one with your classical computer, and then you use the quantum computer to compute what is this P of P. And you can do it efficiently, and depending on that, then you choose the new configuration or not. And so it's a classical computer assisted with a quantum computer, which does, it gets around the sign problem that I mentioned before. So, uh, I mean, there is no sign problem. There is shorter times here because as I mentioned for this particular problem, in order to get relevant physical uh, meaning, you have to choose Delta of the order of one, not one or N. So this would be better. You will have to run for short times. And now you will have to do more measurements because apart from the measurements that you have to do in order to compute these quantities, you have to sample. So you have to put more measurements in this procedure. So what we did is that actually we test this quantum algorithm with a classical computer. So for that, we choose a problem that, it's, uh, that you can solve efficiently with a classical computer with some of the methods. That's the uh, uh, icing problem with the transverse field. This is one here. And then we were able, okay, you can solve it in a 20, uh, in a, in a 20 spin system or in a 100 spin system. That's the size of quantum simulators and NICS devices that are expected for the future. And then we could simulate the computer even with errors. And that's what we did. We put some errors and so on. And I mean, you don't have to read that. And I mean, it works uh, very well. And so we, we say that if there is a 1% error in your quantum computer in, in, in measuring the quantities that you have to measure, then you will be able to, to, I mean, to, to get results that are relevant from the physics point of view, not for this problem, because this problem, as I mentioned, is a problem that you can solve with a classical computer, but with a quantum computer, we took, I mean, problems where there are phase transitions and so on, so we tested uh, carefully. And now the last problem, the problem number three, is very similar to the problem number two, that's the final temperature. Well, I mean, you use the same thing. So at the end, you can rephrase also this expectation value with this state e to the minus h divided by kt in terms of the same quantity that I told you before. So just believe me that again, you can use not for the previous problem two, but also for the problem three, this method, some, I mean, uh, Monte Carlo method in which you would compute the probabilities in order to sample uh, with your quantum computer. And also we did some calculations and check what happens if you put errors compared with exact results and so on, and it works well. So we predict with, with a quantum computer or a NIST device of the order of 100 qubits, then you will be able to obtain already, uh, I mean, sensible results for Hamiltonians like the one that we can compute. But now you could just take this Hamiltonian and start putting some, uh, I mean, putting some other interactions and putting some signs in such a way that this has a sign problem that cannot be solved with Monte Carlo, that is still relevant because it corresponds to some physical systems and start using this device in order to solve some problems that are physically relevant. Okay, so with that, I would like to finish. I was talking about quantum algorithms for finite energy and finite temperature. Okay, so for one algorithm, we showed that it's efficient. Okay, that this exponential speed up with respect to the best or the ones that are used in practice. And for the other algorithm, we show that it circumvents the sign problem in Monte Carlo and is relatively robust in the sense that you can put some errors and things seem still to work. Now, as I mentioned, what I think that it's important is that this can be implemented in these devices and in analog quantum simulators. That that's something that we are doing at the moment. The requirements, again, is that you have to prepare the state of the desired energy. And that's a, I mean, a restriction. And you have to be able to evolve and measure like these quantum simulator computer devices and the outlook. So uh, actually we are now making, trying to make it more robust with respect to errors by detecting some errors and we are adapting it to the different platforms, for example, called atoms in optical lattices, 
we are looking at some other algorithms that would compute some other quantities. And also, I mean, this has inspired us to combine Monte Carlo with tensor network methods in order to push forward the classical algorithms. And with that, I would like to finish and thank you for your attention.